with like AK forty sevens um, and those kind of military type uh, armament. So they're not going in there with like a simple shotgun or a simple pistol. They are going in there with various serious, as um, one of our presidents used to call it, mass, mass, weapons of mass destruction. That's because, and you know what? And no gun control law is going to stop anyone from getting any type of weaponry that they so choose. So when folks come and say, you know, oh, well, we need these gun laws, for who? Because the criminals are damn sure not abiding by your little punk-ass law, you know? And and it takes away from the everyday citizen to protect themselves or to have it in case of something that should happen. You got folks on the other end that say, well, that's stupid because everybody's armed. You got to worry about getting shot. Well, you got to worry about getting shot now, and you have no protection. So what would you rather have, a, a, a weapon and you get shot or no weapon and get shot the fuck up? What, what choice do you want? I know for me, I'd rather have the weapon. If it was my day to die, at least I had something to protect myself with. Somebody just got the better of me. You know, I don't want to be out there just with nothing and then right. end up losing it. That's just my thought, you know, like, and, and like I said before, a lot of these simple minded crimes wouldn't happen if these criminals knew that there's a strong possibility that you're going to run up on somebody to rob them. They're going to give you a parking gift to go with it. A lot of people are good at shooting. Not too many people are good at getting shot. So, you know, it's an argument that will always be there, but I say give individuals their right to have whatever they need to because if you don't, they're just going to get it illegally. So you'll never win this battle. It's like the war on drugs. The war on drugs is as old as I am. We know right. it was targeted for our people. We know what the intended target was, but then they tried to make it seem like, oh, we're trying to get these drugs off of the street. Well, explain to me how you're trying to get the same drugs that you're bringing in the country off the street. It doesn't make logical sense. You understand well, like I saying? said, it's a 46 year lie that continues yeah. to go and on. Like you, I... got, <laughs> you got brothers that's in prison with all these huge, you get less time for murder than you do for selling drugs. It doesn't make wow. any kind of logical sense. You know what I'm saying? You got guys in prison now that have been there 20, 30, 40 years for drugs. People have killed folks and come home already. It's wow. a bunch of bullshit. It is. And like I've said on this show before, and I'll say it again, I've said it to just friends and acquaintances of mine. Uh, we, yeah, I agree. The war on drugs is a total misnomer. It is not a real war that they are actually trying to win because um, it takes – uh, major uh, income in order to bring the drugs in, and I don't know many brothers that actually own a uh, a plane or one of these big boats that they're saying are bringing in the drugs and everything. Nothing. Nothing. Yeah. So that's tell it. Me how it gets here. I don't know how to get here. I think I did hear. I think I did hear our bell. But before we get to the bell, I do need to mention one sad news as well. Another sad news. But you know, there's a disease that's supposed to have been eliminated, and apparently it is being stubborn. It is not being eliminated. But they said that measles cases have surpassed 700 as an outbreak continues unabated. It says the outbreak has been reported in 22 states, and children under the age of five account for about half of the cases. So definitely if you have uh, got some folks that have not been vaccinated, um, I would suggest that they do get vaccinated because the measles outbreak continues to spread in the United States, surpassing 700 cases this year, federal health officials said today. The virus has now been found in 22 states. More than 500 of the 704 cases recorded as of last Friday were in people who had not been vaccinated, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention reported. 66 people have been hospitalized. And as I'm looking at the states, I'm seeing Florida, I'm seeing Georgia, Tennessee, uh, Baltimore, Maryland area, parts of New York, Iowa, uh, California, and a number of other states as well. So uh, definitely uh, this is something that's going on, says Los Angeles is now experiencing a fast-growing outbreak, and hundreds of university students 
who are thought to have been exposed and cannot prove that they have had their shots have been asked to quarantine themselves at home. Last week, the CDC said the number of cases had surpassed the previous high of 667 set in 2014. This year's outbreak is the largest since the disease was declared eliminated in the United States in 2000. In 1994, there were 963 cases. So, you know, they say that uh, elimination in 2000 meant measles viruses was no longer circulating in the United States as it had presumably had since European settlers first brought it to this hemisphere in the 15th or 16th century. Each year after 2000, a few cases arrived from overseas, either in immigrants or in returning tourists, but each outbreak was snuffed out. More than 94% of American parents vaccinate their children against measles and other diseases, Dr. Robert Redfield, director of CDC, has said on Monday. He said his agency is working to reach the small percentage of vaccine-hesitant individuals. He said vaccines are safe and do not cause autism. About 100,000 children in this country under age two have not been vaccinated, he said, meaning they are vulnerable in this outbreak. So definitely there are some folks out there that have not been immunized, and they are definitely urging these people to get immunized. Well, you know what? Those are some of those um, geniuses that say, you know, I'm not going to get my child vaccinated because the vaccines are going to kill them. So now you got all these people that are refusing to get their kids vaccinated, and uh, now the outbreak comes, and everybody's sick now. Exactly. So pick your poison. Pick your poison, one or the other. Which one do you want? No doubt. You know, but but I think I, I did hear. Did, yeah, did I hear a bell? Hear that? You heard the bell. We're going to bring him in in just one second. The straight talk with Dana Ma. Join the conversation at six four six 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 eight eight three. Hi, I'm Danica Patrick. Watching my nieces grow, play, and learn is amazing, but not every child gets to be carefree. One in six kids in the U.S. are hungry. This breaks my heart, and it's something that Feeding America is working to change. Each year, the Feeding America network of food banks rescues billions of pounds of good food that would have gone to waste and gives it to families in need. To help, visit feedingamerica.org. Brought to you by Feeding America and the Ad Council. All right, it's Straight Talk with Dana Mark. Caller, you are on the line. Good evening and welcome. Hello? Can the caller hear us? I think they can, but let's try to back them out and bring them back in. Caller, you are on the air. Good evening. Hey, John, we've got John Brown on the air. I recognize that voice anywhere. How's it going, John? (laughs) I'm doing great. How y'all doing? We're doing good. Uh, Yeah, we hear you now. John, for those of you that are not aware, and um, Dean, I know you do not know John, but John uh, runs the jazz department over at Duke and has been a force, I would say, in the jazz community, as well as being a legal mind as well, because you you got some folks that mix up different careers. So he is both a musician and a lawyer. So we're going to talk about how he blends that, because sometimes I think it's the right brain versus the left brain, but he does both all of these amazing things. But that, I think I first learned about John when he was doing some great things with Duke, bringing in some amazing artists. And, of course, he's been playing himself for a number of years, and he's just an amazing artist in his own right. And they have a jazz jams that has been going on. It'll be actually on. To, um, I don't know if the schedule for this week or if y'all are done for this semester, but it's been going on for a number of years at the Mary Lou Williams Center, and uh, it may even be record setting. I don't know if it's the longest one, because I know my, Brett has been doing his open mic, but you may have Brett beat, but you'll have to tell me if you've got Brett beat in terms of doing a jam session or something of that nature. I know his is more of an open mic and yours is more of a jam session, but uh, mm-hmm. I don't know who's got who beat, but you can explain that to us as well as the importance of jazz to the community. So we'll just start off with the first question, which is what got you into jazz? Well, first of all, thank you for uh, for letting me come and talk a little bit about uh, what I do and uh, the life I love to live. I uh, I, I guess to, to, to appropriately answer the question, I should give a little bit of background that I started out uh, as, uh, as a young person in a musically oriented family. My mother plays piano. My grandmother sang in the choir and many of uh, a few of her sisters sang in the choir also. <clears throat> Excuse me. And I started uh, playing piano when I was five years old. And I didn't like it, so I quit. 
and uh, I started playing the bass when I was nine, and I haven't looked back since then. I started playing in the orchestra then, and I realized that I loved music so much, and it was a great outlet for me. And I just found opportunities to play every kind of music that I possibly could wherever the bass could fit. So I played in the Fayetteville Symphony. I was born and raised in Fayetteville. played in the Fayetteville Symphony. I started playing shows at Fort Bragg, which got me doing a little bit more uh, you know, good leading in the jazz direction. And then, uh, in fact, during my days at the Fort Bragg Playhouse, I got to play with Ray Covington. That's where he and I first met. And, uh, of course, meeting with Ray, it didn't take long for jazz to come up. And between Ray and a piano player named Paul Scott and a trombone player named Richard Jones and a saxophone player named uh, Tom Gavin, and a vibraphone player named Malachi Sharp. All these people reached out to me when I was in my mid-teens and put jazz on my radar. So I started playing classical and jazz, and uh, uh, and, I, and I'm blessed to, to continue that and live the life doing doing. And you're doing an amazing job with that. You definitely are enjoying what you're doing. Every time I see you, it looks like you're thoroughly enjoying the music that you play and enjoying the uh, life that you live that you just put it in everything. Now, just out of curiosity, what was it about, because I didn't even know that about you, John, what was it about the piano that you did not like? I mean, because I've always known you as a bass player and as a um, even a creator of bands of your own and everything, but what, as a young child, was it about the piano that you did not like? You know, I have to say, looking back on it as a, you know, I guess I was five, six, five, and, between five and seven during that time. I think a part of it was just being forced to do it. <laughs> my mother, like I said, my mother plays the piano, and uh, my uh, my parents were both retired teachers, and we used to watch, my sister and I used to have to watch PBS. So, any, you know, they were kind of putting us on this path, and, uh, you know, when you're five or six, I wanted to be outside playing. I didn't want to be inside playing the piano and I was like you know Ma you already do this you kind of got that so let me find my thing uh, so I don't know that it was anything other than just being a a six year old child <laughs> um, you know I, I I wish I had stuck with it and in fact I, I don't have many regrets in life but that's one uh, I wish I had stuck with it because now uh, well I've gotten this past a little bit but my late teens when I decided that I really wanted to take music seriously I would go to try to write some music or go to try to figure something out and I had to take just a few more steps because I had not continued it uh, but you know the piano and I have made up we're friends now so, uh, <laughs> you, you, you've made you made you made up. You're not you're not mad at the piano anymore. That's a good thing. Right. Now, one of the things we talked about on this show in the past is the fact, and I was just wondering what your thoughts on this is that you just brought up the fact of having grown up and watching PBS and things of that nature, and also having been trained in music as an early age. I mean, part of that was through the church, I understand, and part of it might have been through the school system, but it's been the argument of several of our guests in the past that we're not doing a good enough job in terms of teaching our kids through some of the traditional mediums, be that uh, public television, be that uh, music education or things of that nature at a young age. Is that something that you have found? Because, I mean, you're on the college setting, and I imagine that some of these people, that when they come to you at the college setting, you might wish that they were further along than they actually are. And I was just wondering what some of your views on where we are in terms of music education, and it's something, do you think it's something that, we, that we've lost sight of? Mm. Well, I certainly do wish that uh, many of our students are as far along as they think they are. <laughs> that That is certainly the case. Uh, but, no, I, I, I am a poster child and a product of uh, – poster child for and a product of public education. I, I was schooled in the public schools. I went to public schools all in grade school. I went to UNCG undergrad, and I went to law school at Chapel Hill, all public schools. And – and uh, just in addition to that, I will tout being a, a good citizen of North Carolina because in part the reason that I play the bass is because I got to see Duke Ellington's band perform on PBS because, like I mentioned, my parents made us watch that. So I remembered seeing the bass players with playing in a Duke Ellington's band on TV shortly before they came through to start orchestra in our school. So I remembered seeing the instrument first and kind of getting a real uh, uh, excited for being in person, a real look at it on television, watching PBS. And then beyond that, 
uh, I really decided that I wanted to go into music because North Carolina 